H.G. Wells wrote a very interesting short story called The Country of the Blind. And in it, everybody's blind. They're born blind and nobody even knows, even has as a reference point, what it means to be sighted. So then when some people who can see come into that culture, they're completely foreign. They can describe something, but nobody, everybody thinks they're crazy. Because what is sight? Uh, how can you describe a vision to somebody who doesn't know what vision is? Well, that's the way it is with us sometimes when it comes to heaven. Because when there are descriptions in the Bible of this realm called heaven, we've never been there, we've never seen it, and we lack the ability to see that unseen realm. And that's where the interesting challenge comes. How can the Bible describe heaven in such a way that we can understand it even though, as it is right now, we can't see it, not because it's not real, but because we don't have the capacity to see it. We're blind. Everybody's flying with wings and everything. Big gates, blue sky, clouds. I don't believe that there's a heaven. Honestly, uh, I don't really believe in heaven. I don't know. I think it's a nice thought. I think it's a good, uh, yeah. a good psychological crush for some people. Heaven will be clean, very serene and white and cheery. It would be like living in the suburbs. Gorgeous. I just think that heaven is whatever you want it to be. So if you want to fly, you fly. If you want to eat cheese all day, then you eat cheese. I think the main thing that made me want to write about the subject of heaven goes back to 1981 when my mom, who was also one of my closest friends, was dying of cancer. I knew she was going to heaven, but I didn't know what heaven was. So every day I would be by her bedside and I'd be reading Revelation 21 and 22. And as I would read them to her, I, it, it just hit me. This is a real place. It's tangible. In Revelation 21, verse 4, Jesus says, No more death, no more suffering, no more pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Behold, I am making it all things new. For those who are suffering right now, a clear understanding of heaven will give you purpose and it'll give you perspective and it'll give you hope. When we think about heaven, we often just have these real uh, floaty, ethereal, this is where disembodied spirits are and angels, but it's not really human. So that's why we don't get excited about it. But the Bible portrays heaven in a much different way, in a very human, very physical way, and we're going to live forever on the new earth. Scripture tells us that Right now, we die, we know Jesus, we die, we go home to be with the Lord where He is. But where He is right now is in this realm called heaven, called paradise. But He says in Revelation 21, 3, that the day is coming when He is going to bring heaven down to earth. Three times in Revelation 21, 3, it says God will come down to dwell with His people. That word with is key. It's not that he will take us to live up where he lives forever. We'll live up where he lives temporarily after we die. But in the resurrection, he will come down to live where we live forever. So it says the Lord God will dwell with his people on the new earth. We can be optimistic about the future as believers because of the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. We can look around, we can say there's a lot of sin in this world, there's a lot of death, there's a lot of suffering, but we don't have to lose hope because we know that God made this earth to be something else. He made Eden. And yes, there was a fall, yes, there was sin, yes, we live under the curse, but we look forward to the new earth where everything is going to be made right. So we live in a sense between Eden and the new earth. We are optimists because we are realists. And the reality is that Jesus Christ paid the price not only for our redemption, but for the redemption of the earth itself. There is going to be a new us living on a new earth for all eternity. 
Job, more than anything else, cried out for a redeemer. And at one point in Job 19, he says, I know that my redeemer lives and that in the end, he will stand upon the earth and I will see him with my own eyes. And he says, after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh, I will see God. What does that mean? Well, after his skin has been destroyed, meaning after his body has died, his body is in the grave deteriorating, yet he will see God. But he says, yet in my flesh I will see God. So here is a clear reference to the resurrection, even in the Old Testament. Here's a man who's crying out, longing for the day that he is going to see God in a resurrected body. He's going to see his Redeemer standing upon a resurrected earth. And he says, how my heart yearns within me. We all see him differently. We all envision him every day, however we choose to envision him. I don't think he can really put a picture to his face. I could hear him maybe, but not see him. I'm not sure about that. If you believe in God, you have the vision within you as to what you think he or she looks like. How can we see God today in our lives? Well, one way is spoken of in, in Romans 1.20. It says that God has revealed his invisible qualities in the visible creation. So we can look at creation and we can learn certain things about God. Look at the majesty of creation. You look at the waterfall and it's majestic because God is majestic. It's great because God is great. You look at the rocks, you look at the trees, they have the beauty they have because God is beautiful. It's derivative. It starts with who God is and he's manifested his beauty in his creation. If you look at a painting on a wall and you say, well, who painted that? Well, where, where did that come from? Uh, imagine if somebody then uh, says, well, what happened was that those globs of paint formed on that canvas over millions of years. You'd say, no, 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 no. Look, it's, it's design, it's perfect. It's, it's clearly the work of an artist. All art is the work of an artist. All the art in creation is the work of the divine artist. We can see God in people being made in his image. So you've got a, a young mother who's changing the diapers uh, of her little children and, and uh, she may not be a hero in the world's eyes, but she's devoting herself, she's giving herself to help this little person. And the qualities of God, the kindness, the love, uh, the, the tenderness uh, in, in, in caring uh, for his children, we can see in people who are made in his image. So we see God in his creation, we see God in the people made in his image. I've heard it said of people, they're so heavenly minded, they're of no earthly good. But according to the Bible, we're to set our minds where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. We're to set our minds above. We're to think about the things of heaven. And as we think about the things of heaven, we're motivated to live life here in such a way that it's gonna make a difference for all eternity. So it's a very practical way to live, to be heavenly minded. The Apostle Paul says in Philippians that he puts behind him certain things and looks forward and lives his life with a forward motion. To know Jesus Christ, to serve Jesus Christ, that's what life is about. And with that perspective, being reminded of who Jesus is and what he has done on his behalf, Paul is able to live life today as a different person, a changed person, a transformed person. He lived in light of eternity, and that's what God calls upon us to do. And it's an exciting way to live. I think everybody does. Anybody that wants to. So as long as you reason and like have good ethics and everything like that, you make it to heaven. People who believe in Jesus. A computer has a lot of default settings. And so it means that that's a given. That's automatic. That's the direction it's going to go unless you do something to change it. A lot of people think that in life, the default destination of every human being is heaven. But the Bible actually teaches something different. 
because Jesus said, wide is the way that leads to destruction, and many people go that way. But straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leads to life, and few there be that find it. Now that's not because God wants it that way. It's because we as human beings tend to choose the path of sin. We don't like to repent. We don't like to confess. But Jesus said more about hell than any other person in all of Scripture. So the Jesus who is full of love also was concerned because he didn't want people to go to hell and actually taught that the default destination, given the fact that we're sinners and that means we're separated from God, is actually hell and that he came to die on the cross in order to take upon himself the sins of all people who have ever lived for all time, past, present, future, and taking upon himself their sins pay the price of redemption on their behalf. Sometimes you go to funerals, memorial services, and you just get the impression that it's automatic. Everybody goes to heaven, except maybe Hitler and Stalin and Mao and, you know, the guy that we didn't like that lived next door to us or something like that. I mean, we can make a few exceptions that maybe we think are going to, to hell. But for the most part, we think everybody's going to heaven, but scripture doesn't teach that. A bike ride, I'm going to bike ride. <laughs> I really hope and pray that my grandchildren will have a grasp of the reality of heaven, that they won't have this float up in the, up in the air kind of thing and sit around on the clouds and, and strum harps. If disembodied spirits can strum harps, I guess they really can't. But the, all of these misconceptions of heaven, I don't want my grandkids to have any of those. And I don't believe they will because their parents know the reality of what heaven's about, and we get to teach them as well. But just to look forward to a resurrected state where they can see the beauty around them in this life, and they can say, that beauty without the curse, without the curse of sin in our lives, and without disease, without suffering, without death, that's the world to come. That's the promise of God's word, that we're gonna live with him forever on a perfect earth that is all he intended it to be.